Well, thank you all for being here this morning. And Kate assures me that the beauty of the second service is I can talk as long as I want. <laughs> now, I'm just kidding, sort of. <laughs> but I am, I am Dr. Mary Neal, and I want to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes about hope and faith and trust. Because I believe that if you choose to trust God's promises, that directly impacts how you experience your daily life. And my understanding of these three words, these three concepts, changed in 1999 when indeed I, I died while kayaking in South America. And I was pinned under 8 to 10 feet of water at the base of a waterfall. And I was without oxygen for 30 minutes before CPR was initiated. And I have to tell you that when I regained consciousness, I was in an absolute state of shock. And it wasn't shock based on the fact that I just drowned. And it wasn't because I had multiple, multiple broken bones in my legs. No, I was in an absolute state of shock because I could not believe that I'd been sent back to my body from a place I will call heaven. And I have to tell you that despite the tremendous turbulence of the water over me, underwater it was very calm, very peaceful. And I discovered a couple of things. First of all, where God's love is present, there was no room for fear. And I'm a pragmatist. I knew the likelihood of my surviving was pretty slim. And I made a, a decision to ask that God's will be done. And, and I didn't ask it in a passive way, sort of like, well, gee, I'm going to die, so okay, Lord, uh, give me some help. No, it was a very active choice. God, your will be done, regardless of what that meant. It was the first time in my life I actually gave up control of the outcome. Like so many of you, I said the Lord's Prayer, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times in my lifetime. But again, like most of you, I was self-confident, accomplished. When I said the Lord's Prayer, I really meant, Lord, I want your will to be done as long as it's in line with my own will and, of course, on my timetable. But when I was underwater, I truly meant your will will be done. And the moment I asked that, I was immediately overcome with a very, very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured by Christ that everything was fine. My husband would be fine. My young children would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And I have to tell you, it wasn't just that I thought it was Christ. I knew it was Jesus just as I would know my husband of 30 years if I saw him in the grocery store. It was an absolute knowledge. And believe me, I did not deserve to be held by Christ. And that's one of the first really powerful parts of this experience for me because none of us deserve it. We all talk about not having to earn God's love, but we don't really believe it. We think that we need to earn it and we don't. I absolutely knew that not only was Christ holding me, but Christ would be holding any person who asked. And I was taken through a life review that had absolutely little to do with judgment and absolutely everything to do with love and compassion and a grace that comes from an absolute understanding And as we looked at all the really miserable, painful parts of my own life, I was given this incredible opportunity to see those events from a perspective of 25, 30, 35 times removed. And in doing that, I was shown again and again and again the truth in God's promise that beauty does come of all things. And I was able to see the distant ripple effects of all of those events. 
and see how they impacted not just me, but impacted the world and did create beauty. And eventually, Christ sort of released my spirit to the heavens, and I was immediately greeted by a group of somethings. People, spirits, beings, those words mean different things to different people, and so I'm never really quite sure which word to choose. But they were people who had known me and loved me as long as I have existed. And I knew on an absolute level that they were there sent by God to love me and welcome me and guide me and make me feel known. And they were overjoyed. They were so jubilant that I was there. And I have to tell you, there was this sort of change in time or dimension. I'm not quite sure what the appropriate words are, but I could be with them celebrating and simultaneously look back at the river and I could see my bloated purple body pulled ashore. I could watch as my friends started CPR and I did recognize my own body and I knew that I was dead. And it was remarkable because I had a great life, magnificent life. I had a wonderful husband. I had four little children who I love more than life itself. But despite that, when I looked at my body, I knew that I had absolutely no intention of returning because I had a very overwhelming sensation of being home, of being where I really, really, truly belong and I might add where we all truly belong. And I never wanted to leave this particular part of the experience. And, and I will tell you that I'm very analytical. And even at this point, there was part of my little thought balloon off to the side that was thinking, wow, this is an incredible hallucination. Never knew it would be so good. But the other part of me knew that it wasn't just a hallucination. And these people started guiding me down this pathway. And this pathway was the most beautiful experience I could ever imagine. The thing that absolutely speaks to my soul, moves me to tears, is color. The intensities of colors, the, the intricacies of flowers and the aromas of flowers. That to me speaks beauty. And that is what I experienced. This pathway was not only woven together with fibers of God's love, but exploded with every color of the universe and some that don't exist here. And flowers that were too many to count and these beautiful aromas. And, and I was experiencing them all at once. Again, there was a shift in time so that I could see it and understand the colors and hear the colors. I know that doesn't make sense, <laughs> but that's what it was like. And I absolutely believe that God presents to each one of us at the time of our death the experience that similarly will speak to us, will make us feel loved and welcomed and known. And for other people, it'll be something else. Personally, I think that speaks to the truth of these types of experiences. Because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, if you break your arm, I can pretty much tell you what your experience is going to be. There are some differences in terms of pain, but it's a physiologic process, and I could tell you pretty much the timeline of what's going to happen. But when it comes to these near-death or after-death experiences, we all describe not only this purity of God's love, but we describe intense beauty, inexplicable beauty, indescribable beauty, but the details vary, and they should vary, because here on earth, we all experience beauty differently, and why would it be different at the end of our life? My husband, for example, is a beautiful musician and is moved by beautiful music, 
I am tone deaf. <laughs> so if I heard beautiful music, it would not speak to me. Other people will see their animals, art, whatever it is that truly moves your soul. I absolutely believe that is what God will present to you. So we kept moving down this pathway toward this great dome structure of sorts that I knew was the point of no return. And as an aside, I will tell you that these people are, again, beings, spirits, I don't know, who were going with me did have a physical form. They had a head and arms and legs and, and they were wearing these robes. They were absolutely brilliant from within, exploding with God's love. And I don't know if that's how we always appear. I only know that in my part of the experience it was a, a physical form, but maybe that's just because that's what I would understand. And every time we got a little bit further down this path, the people who were still at the river kept calling to me to come back and take a breath. Please come back and take a breath. And I could hear them. I could see them. And one fellow was a young man, only 18 at the time, and he was really vulnerable. And I would be on the pathway and look back, and I'd say, okay, I'll give you a breath. So I would go back and lie down and take a breath and immediately rejoin these people who were taking me down this pathway. And, and we'd get a little bit further. And I have to tell you that my only desire was to get to this point of no return. It was the most alluring uh, reality I could ever begin to imagine. And, and then this young fellow would start calling to me again to come back and take a breath. And Eventually, I'd be overcome with compassion, and I'd say, okay, just a minute. <laughs> I'll be right back. And I would go back down and take a breath, and this cycle went on and on 15 or 20 times. And it was very interesting to talk to him afterward because I was very frustrated that he kept calling me back. And he was very frustrated because I would take a breath, which to me means one, and then I would stop breathing again. Eventually, we did get to the end of this pathway, and I was at this great arched entryway of sorts for what seemed like many hours. And while I was there, I had a complete understanding of the divine order of the universe. Not necessarily an understanding of the divine nature, but the divine order. I absolutely understood and could see how all living creatures are entirely interconnected. I also had an absolute understanding, even though I can't describe it, we don't have the language to describe it, I had an absolute understanding of how it could possibly be true that God knows each and every one of us individually, loves each and every one of us as though we're the only ones and has a plan for each and every one of our lives and for the world that is one of hope. And for me, that was always a sticking point. I'm a very pragmatic person, and there are billions of us on this planet. We have so much trouble knowing the people in our own neighborhood, let alone loving them. I never could really kind of get my head around that idea that God is a God of all of us. But I can tell you again that it is absolutely true. God knows every one of the billions of us on this planet individually and loves each one of us as though none of you exist. <laughs> and has a plan for each one of us and for the world that is one of hope. And again, I kept trying to get over this threshold because I knew that was it. That was the point of no return. And eventually these people told me that it wasn't my time, that I had more work to do on earth, and that I would have to go back to my body. And
And so I did what <laughs> I think any reasonable person would do, and I said, okay, and now I'm good. I can stay. I had already been reassured by Christ that everything would be fine. So I, I objected, and when I objected, I was given a laundry list of work I still had to do. And I have to tell you, there wasn't a single thing on that list that I was excited about. There wasn't a single thing on that list that I felt qualified to do, that I felt like I had the time to do. Every single thing on the list was something that would challenge me, push me, make me step outside of my comfort zone, because that's the way it is, right? I mean, nobody changes when things are good. When things are good, we, we never want to change. The reality is we change and learn and grow when we're challenged. We can all look back at ourselves from 20 years ago, and we can see all the ways in which we've changed. And usually we've changed in better ways. It's impossible for us to look 20 years in the future and know how we will be different. But intellectually, we all know we will be. And we will be different because of the challenges we have faced. So this laundry list was filled with many challenges, including news of the coming and unexpected death of my oldest son, who at the time was only nine years old. And indeed, 10 years later, he was hit by a car and killed. When I was told specifically about my son's coming death, I asked the question that would be on anyone's lips, which is why? Why my son? And when I asked that, I was immediately reminded of my life review in which I had been shown again and again and again the truth of God's promise that beauty comes of all things. And I was reminded that it's a matter of trust. We may not see the beauty that comes out of challenge and heartbreak and heartache but we can trust that that beauty will eventually emerge, whether we can see it or not. And with that then, I was taken back to my body and reunited there on the side of the river. And I have to tell you, this river was in the middle of nowhere. It was in South America, and it was in southern Chile. And in 1999, at that point in time, there was nothing there were barely any dirt roads. There was no search and rescue. There was no medical care. We didn't have cell phones or sat phones or any way to communicate. If we had, there was no one to call anyway. And so when I regained consciousness, I, of course, was in a state of shock because I couldn't believe that I got kicked out. And the people who resuscitated me were in an absolute state of shock because they were thinking, wow. First of all, CPR doesn't usually work. It works 75% of the time on TV, and so we think it works. But the reality is, it doesn't usually work. And when you're out in the middle of nowhere, it really doesn't work. And after 30 minutes without oxygen, it never works. And so they were in a state of shock, first of all, because I actually opened my eyes. But they were also in a state of shock because they were thinking, oh, now what? <laughs> we were in the middle of nowhere. There was no way out other than the river. The hillsides were very, very steep and very thickly covered with bamboo. And just as they were trying to figure out what they were going to do next, these two Chilean men just appeared. They didn't have a boat. There's no other way to get there. But they appeared. They never said anything. They just walked over put my body on top of a boat, and then they, with these friends of mine, just started trying to carry me up the hillside. One of them actually had a machete. And it was a many-hour process. And after a number of hours, 
we emerged onto this tiny dirt road, as I said, in the middle of nowhere. And exactly there on the road was an ambulance. Now, even today, and I go back to Chile every year, and even today in this part of Chile, I mean, there are not ambulances. And the nearest medical services were four or five hours drive away. And the, the ambulance driver hopped out, and, and these friends of mine described him wearing what a five-year-old would imagine an ambulance driver was supposed to wear. It was just a little off. And he never said a word. He never said, wow, what's happened? I was a mess. I mean, I had both legs were multiply broken. I just drowned. I was on this kayak. I mean, you can imagine, this is a, a scene that clearly would tell someone that there's a problem. But this guy never said a word. He never asked what had happened. He just calmly walked over, started putting me in the back of the ambulance. And when one of my friends looked at him and said, what are you doing here? He just very calmly said, waiting. Do I believe he was an angel? Absolutely. Do I believe the young men who appeared on the riverbank were angels? Absolutely. The friends of mine spent the next two days trying to track down the ambulance driver, trying to track down the people, and of course, they didn't exist. And I have to tell you that the subsequent days and weeks were filled with more profound, undeniable miracles. And I had this experience of being neither here nor there. I was sort of moving between the two worlds, one that contained my past and my future, the God of the universe and all that is love, and one that contained my present with the family I cherish and the life I enjoy. After a few weeks, things sort of, uh, you know, kind of that veil sort of a pacified. I had a couple of more out-of-body experiences where I believe I was back in heaven. It was the same intensity of God's love, the same intensity of beauty and emotion. I had more conversation with Christ, specifically about this laundry list and about my son's coming death. And then eventually that was over. And I was left with what to make of it. And I have to tell you that at the time, I sort of thought, well, I probably just imagined that. Even though I have absolutely no, no creativity, I thought, well, I, I just, it's a figment of my imagination. Even though I knew I would never be the same again. So I set about trying to figure out what had happened to me. And I spent the many, many weeks and months of my hospitalization and rehabilitation trying to come up with a scientific explanation. So I first read through all my medical records and talked to the people at the river, and then really fueled by this absolute desire to discount everything I'd been told, including what I'd been told about my son's coming death, I read extensively. I read pretty much everything that has ever been written about drowning, about the physiology of a dying brain, about dreams and hallucinations and anoxia and seizures and neurotransmitter dumping. In the end, though, I discovered that all of the conventional explanations fell short. Those medical and scientific gaps were really unbridgeable. And absolutely nothing could explain either my unscathed survival or my profound spiritual experiences. And eventually I realized that I'd had a near-death or after-death experience. And I also discovered that I wasn't alone in that experience. Almost 20 million people in this country alone 
have had these sorts of profoundly transformative experiences. And the continuation of the soul or consciousness is described in every culture, every faith tradition, and every age group. Even very young children who have never been exposed to religion of any kind recount near-death experiences. Even 75% of avowed atheists have an experience in which they identify a being as Jesus or God. And they're also similar. We all describe this intensity of love and interconnectedness with all living creatures. And regardless of our prior beliefs, God becomes the only truth. Now, you, you can imagine that <laughs> these experiences are, are profoundly transformative. And the most common question that I am asked is, okay, so what? Great story, but so what? How has my life been transformed? And more importantly, is there something in my experience that can transform the lives of other people? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I find that the most profound transformation for me, and I believe what can be the most profound, profound transformation for any of you, is this transformation from a hope or a faith in the truth of God's promises to an absolute trust. Because when you trust, which is sort of faith in action, when you trust the truth of God's promises, it radically changes who you really are, how you live your life, and why you live your life. And to help you understand this idea, and, and I separate faith into those three things because uh, I think it helps um, understand what I'm talking about. And as one example, imagine for a minute that you have spent days walking through the mountains of Nepal. And you come across a rickety old hand bridge that crosses a very, very, very deep gorge. Now, let's face it, every one of us is going to look at that and go, oh, I'm terrified. I'm not crossing that. You know, there are slats missing and the whole thing. We've come too far to turn back, but we don't want to go forward. And we can do a couple of different things. We can hope that that bridge is going to hold our weight when we cross it, but that hope is just a wish. It's based on nothing. We can develop a faith that that bridge is going to hold our weight, and we can do that by reading how the bridge was constructed, we can talk to other people who have already crossed over. We can even watch people cross ahead of us. But all of that is external. It isn't until you actually step onto the bridge that you have trust. And that's what I mean when I say that trust is sort of this faith in action. Similarly, if you hope that God's promises are true, that's great. But that's, like, that's no different than saying, well, I hope it rains, or I hope it's sunny, or it's just a wish. It's not based on anything. Many, many people say, well, no, I have faith. I have faith that God's promises are true. But just like the person at the bridge... In our culture, at least, and, and I do not mean to discount the faith as described in the Bible, but I think in our culture, the way we typically think about faith or talk about faith is just like the guy at the bridge. It's based on the external. We read what happened in biblical times. We 
listen to our friends, we listen to the priests, we listen to all kinds of things, but it's all external. And you and I have both had the experience many times of knowing about someone who had a deep faith only to have it shaken or lost when it was challenged. And I contend that that faith was lost or shaken because it was never transformed to trust. And so I believe that trust is the key. And trust is where we should all be moving to. And I absolutely know that trust develops when you see God at work and present in your own life, not in anyone else's life. And I absolutely know that God really is present and active in every person's life. Whether you, you believe it or not, whether you even want it to be true or not, it is true. And it is looking back at your own life and finding all the evidence of God's presence that allows you to then step onto that bridge. And so you might say, okay, well, great. What does trust do for me? I will tell you what trust does for me. And I believe this is available to anyone. So as I trust God's promise of forgiveness and of grace, my past is released. I know that God understands me fully. And with that understanding, has nothing but compassion for me, which I believe is grace. And so I can let go of all of my guilt or remorse or anger with myself. I, I'm released. My past doesn't define me. It doesn't dictate who I am, and it certainly doesn't determine what God thinks of me. I'm also able to be free from anger or bitterness or resentment toward other people who have hurt me. Because similarly, I know that if I could understand them and understand what brought them to the point where they hurt me, I would feel nothing but compassion. No different than I know that God has for me. And so I can entirely release my past. Doesn't hold me bondage. Similarly, I don't worry about the future. First of all, I know I can assure you that death is nothing but the doorway to home, to our true home, our permanent home, our spiritual home. And so I don't have to be afraid of death because I know that, you know, it's sort of like, going on a great trip to Europe. I go to Europe, it's a great adventure. There are some wonderful things, there are things that aren't so good. <laughs> I mean, I said earlier, an adventure is just a disaster that you survive. And, you know, you go to Europe, you go to wherever, and you have this great adventure. And then you come back to Florida, or you come back to wherever your hometown is. And it's the very existence of your home in Florida and the family and the friends who are waiting for you there that allows you to go to Europe and have this magnificent adventure because it brings context and meaning and purpose to your time in Europe. And that's what this permanent home does. The fact that death is a doorway to this home and this home brings context to my life, allows me to experience this life as that great adventure with all of its ups and downs. I'm also not worried about tomorrow. I still plan. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if I could claim to be a type A person anymore, but I'm still a planner for sure. But I absolutely trust that God has a plan for my life that is one of hope. And so I absolutely trust and I know that if my plans for tomorrow 
do not come to fruition, it's because God has something different and probably a whole lot better in mind for me. And, you know, we can all go, we can prove that to ourselves. You know, we can look back at our past and be so grateful for the things that didn't happen. You know, thank you, Lord, that I didn't get that job that I so desperately wanted because it allowed me to be available for something even greater. Or, you know, I, I say this one, you know, thank God, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that I didn't marry that boy in college who broke my heart because it would have been a disaster and I wouldn't have been available for the man I eventually married. And so I don't worry about tomorrow and I'm freed from my past. And what that does is it allows me to be fully present in this moment, on this day. And because I don't have all of this extraneous worry or emotion going on, I am free to constantly be listening for where God would lead me, for what God would have me be doing. I am able to constantly try to reflect God's love to others and to the world because I'm not bogged down by either the past or the future. And that allows me to live in an absolute state of gratitude because even when things are rotten, even when things are miserable, I know that I am being changed, that the world is being changed, and that beauty will eventually emerge from all things. And so it's easy for me to truly be in a state of gratitude, regardless of my circumstances. And most importantly, I am absolutely able to live in a state of joy. And I believe God intends for each one of us to live a joy-filled life. And again, that is a joy. Joy is different from happiness, right? Happiness is based on whether things are good or not so good. But joy transcends circumstances. And I will tell you that even on my deepest, darkest days of sorrow after the death of my son, and, and no, my experience does not protect me from grief. Grief is hard. But I will tell you that even on my most grief-filled days, I am absolutely still experiencing great joy because that is the power of this transformation from hope or faith to an absolute trust in God's promises. And that's why I'm here this morning because I want to not just encourage you, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to go home this afternoon and I want you to start doing your own research. Collect your own data. And then I want you to look at your own life. Look back at your life and look for those times that God has led you and loved you and held you and carried you. And I want you to try to prove what I'm saying wrong. Because I know you will not be able to. And I also know that if you do the work of looking back at your own life, if you do the work of seeing God's handprint in your own life, then you also will be able to choose to trust God's promises. And when you make that choice and you step out onto that bridge, your life will be changed in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking up this challenge. And may God bless your journey.